Welcome everyone to our panel on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the paddle sports industry. My name is Ethan Billingsley. I'll be one of your facilitators today. Uh, my role here at Colorado State University is that I'm the program lead for our Adventure Tourism Graduate Certificate. Uh, in addition to that, I moonlight as a river sports guide in the summer months, a uh, little part-time fun gig. And so it keeps my uh, toes in the water, so to speak, pun intended. We are joined by another facilitator today. Natalie, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, thanks a lot, Ethan. My name is Natalie Uwe, and I'm the Director of Tourism Enterprise Programs here at CSU within the College of Human Dimensions and Natural Resources, uh, College of Warner, Warner College of Natural Resources in the Department of Human Dimensions of Natural Resources. Can't forget that Warner. I know. It's a bit, it's a bit of a mouthful there. Um, but before we started, I just want to quickly introduce um, our department and what we do here and, and sort of how we relate to this space. Um, our department's very much focused on tourism and conservation and looking at the intersect of, you know, protecting and managing natural resources, um, sustainable business practices, and then also looking at sustainable travel and also outdoor recreation and building sustainable and resilient communities. So that's really a, a, the focus and the crux of what we do. Um, within the tourism recreation side, we have a number of different graduate and undergraduate programs. At the undergraduate level, we have a, a, a bachelor's degree in natural resource tourism, which is offered both online and on campus because we recognize a lot of folks in the industry uh, are situated in a place um, and don't necessarily have the ability to come uh, to Fort Collins. And then at the graduate level, we have a master's of tourism management, which is a professional um, based masters. Uh, so it's really designed for folks who are wanting to go into the tourism industry, start their own business, or just become a leader in the field. Um, and then more specifically, we have these niche area certificates, like Ethan mentioned, like the certificate um, in adventure tourism. We also have one in ski area management. Um, and also it's, it's a little outside of the tourism realm, but it's related in terms of communications for conservation. Again, recognizing the importance of conservation, climate change, and being able to communicate that to a broader uh, number of constituents. Um, so again, those are offered online. Um, Wes, who is our communications coordination, uh, coordinator for the department, he's throwing some links in the chat there. So if anyone on this call is interested in learning more about any of those programs, uh, feel free to, to take a look. Um, but in the context of today's presentation, you know, obviously diversity, equity, and inclusion is having its, its moment in the spotlight, but this is a focus area um, that we're really serious about at the department and at the college level. You know, it's something we really seek to integrate in, in all of our programs, in the curriculum, in the content, in the guest speakers we bring, in the multiple perspectives we highlight um, in a lot of our resources. Um, but at the college level, um, you know, I think part of the commitment of Warner College and Natural Resources to this area is that we've had multiple hires specific, uh, specifically, you know, designed to focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, including our Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Ricky Fryerson, who is on the call here today, and I'll hand it over to him to do a quick introduction. Unmute. <laughs> <laughs> It won't let you. Oh, there you go. Okay, there you go. So, put it. That's the way to make me be quiet. Is to have the mute button. Hello and greetings, everyone. Uh, again, yes, my name is Dr. Ricky Farris, and Director of uh, Diversity and Inclusion for Warner College of Natural Resources. And thank you for taking your time to learn. Uh, about DEI efforts that's being held and conducted by Human Dimensions of Natural Resources as well. Um, as Natalie stated before, that this is not only a, a departmental commitment, but it's a college level commitment as well, in which we are trying to be intentional and aspirational in advancing the goals and efforts of DEI so that we can be inclusive and, uh, and, and, and develop an inclusive minded ideolo ideology as we move forward in curriculum and, and, and awareness to communities that we serve. And so real quickly, I just wanted to kind of share on the college level, two things that we're doing to really bring awareness to you, the students, on how you can be engaged and be a part of this activism and this awareness and education that we do to advance DEI. So real quick, if I have the opportunity, I want to share my screen here. And the first thing is I wanted to uh, let you see our website. And in our website, 
and I'll put the chat, uh, the link in the chat when I get done sharing the screen. But in our website, you'll see that we have uh, um, this page and you'll come up about what it is about. And right here, we're adding a new feature that we just launched today, which is our diversity digest for the college in which you can come in and get the newsletter by signing up here right under diversity and inclusion programs and sign up for the newsletter uh, again right here. But you, there's tons of resources that students can utilize at their leisure here with the Warner College podcast, training centers, videos. If you don't like to read like myself, you have that. But the very first uh, diversity newsletter we had is this one coming out that came out literally this morning. And then you can see that we have a lot of different things as far as we did a bystander intervention today, the diversity symposium that's coming up in the fall, our untold story series that we do here within the college to highlight counter narratives and often un, uh, untold contributions from ethnic uh, communities in advancing uh, natural resource efforts our learning lab and where you can learn about various aspects of uh, people or persons of color who are uh, doing this work in a productive and advocating way. And then we look at, um, a, a, you know, we give you a little tidbit of information to learn from as far as a tool, uh, terms and definition. And then we try to do a community highlight where we're highlighting our partnership with organizations that are advancing DEI efforts. And then we try to do a student spotlight. So if you, the student, have something that you're passionate about regarding DEI within Warner College and you want to have your uh, story or your information and efforts shared, please let us know. And then you got that lovely guy right there at the end, at the end uh, where I always bring you an invitation. You know, you always put the dessert at the end of the, at the, end of the, uh, the newsletter. So with that, it was just a quick highlight of who we are, what we're doing. And again, the work that HDNR is doing is just an extension of the commitment that we have at the college level. So like you today, I'm here to learn and figure out ways I can be involved in nature as well, because my colleagues know um, I need to do better in being involved in nature and learn just like with our students. So I'm here to be a participant just like everyone else. So sit back and enjoy and um, I will do the same as well. So thank you so much. And I'll put the link in right now. Awesome. Thank you, Ricky. So we're going to get started uh, with today's panel because we do have limited time, but how it's going to go is our panelists are going to do an, a brief introduction and then we've got a set number of questions for them to answer to really highlight their experience and knowledge in this space. But we're definitely open to, to questions uh, from students and other audience members. So throughout the presentation, as you think of questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we've got folks in the background who are going to be monitor monitoring that and making sure that, you know, Hopefully, if time permits, we can we can attend to all of them. Just some other minor housekeeping. Um, if you can just make sure to, to keep yourself on mute um, at all times, that would be great. Um, as a department, we are also recording this panel, uh, so just making people aware of that. Um, and then just to sort of follow on from that previous conversation we had before we officially started, for those of you who want to make sure that the speakers stay in view uh, within your Zoom uh, page, if you go to the right top hand corner there's a view button and you can click on it and you can choose speaker view and that ensures that anyone who is currently speaking um, will stay within sort of that top one to four kind of position so you can see our guest panelists um, and with that I'll hand it over to Ethan. Yeah thank you Natalie. So a quick little bit of background on the paddle sports industry before we introduce our panelists and I just want to throw out that this paddle was in my office before this panel. And I did throw it up there as a little extra decoration uh, for the panel. It's a bit of an antique, but I hope you enjoy it. Okay, little background on the paddle sports industry that uh, might provide some important context for this, this conversation. So I pulled some information from the 2019 special report on the paddle sports industry that was compiled by the Outdoor Foundation which if you're not familiar is affiliated with the Outdoor Industry Association, one of the largest trade groups uh, representing the outdoor industry. So in 2018, 22.9 million Americans or 7.6% of the US population took to rivers, streams, lakes, and oceans to participate in at least one paddling activity. Yay. Paddling participants tend to be Caucasians who have attended or graduated from college, they are best represented by an average annual household income of at least 75,000, a demographic characteristic that has steadily climbed since 2014. At 53%, males make up a slightly larger percentage of paddlers than females. Male participation, however, is declining at 1% per year 
and female participation is increasing by the same amount. Although the vast majority of paddlers are Caucasian, there is an opportunity to engage minority groups, which are largely underrepresented in paddle sports. While Caucasian participation has remained relatively unchanged since 2015, Hispanic participation has increased by almost 3% since 2013. That's more than 773,000 new participants in just six years. African-American participation has also increased incrementally by about 1% per year. There's lots more data and stuff that we could dive into to, to provide context, but I think we'll get quite a bit of that from our, our panelists today. Uh, if you're interested, that report again was 2019 special report on the paddle sports industry uh, that was compiled by the Outdoor Foundation. If you wanna go search that and, and check out all the data that they've provided. And without any further ado, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves. And I was actually hoping that Emily might kick this off uh, and share a little bit about yourself and your background. I'd love to, thanks Ethan. Sports. Great. Um, I have to just first uh, express some strong gratitude for having and hosting the space. Uh, for the other panelists who are on here, I feel honored and somewhat intimidated, if I'm being real, uh, to be with uh, such experience on here. And I'll just take a couple of minutes to hopefully share some insight and background that you wouldn't necessarily see in my bio, um, make it a little bit more real. So I was born and raised in Alaska uh, for the first 13 years and um, came from a, a rafting industry on my mom's side. And so um, I, I feel like I, I had like parallel rivers running to each other. And um, I came to paddle sports fairly late in, in, my, in my life. I was the, the last of my cousins uh, on that side to become a guide and kind of took my own time and always thought that uh, rivers really symbolized a lot for me. And I think also that um, aligned with my journey uh, to diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, I came to Colorado in 2001 and became a guide in the Grand Canyon. Um, Ethan, I like how you talked about, you know, dipping your toes in the water because that's, that's my side hustle that keeps me grounded and keeps me remembering amongst billion year old rocks that uh, we are all pretty inconsequential um, and our time on the, on the world does matter. So um, I say that I came from a, a rafting family um, to really highlight something that I think needs to be talked about as accessibility to the rafting industry, to the paddle sports, that if you had someone to paddle the way before you, it feels much more possible and that nepotism really is often found within our sports and, and having guides, mentors, you know, co-paddlers, whatever that looks like is really, really important to broaden. And so, you know, um, uh, I think I'm just seeing Dr. Ricky, but <laughs> because I'm, you know, Dr. Ricky was talking before about, you know, t telling the unspoken stories. And I think that that has been extremely important to why um, I do what I do with engaged coaching and consulting and how I kind of got my paddle in the water um, in the Grand Canyon and uh, was able to work pretty closely with some leadership in some different uh, organizations and um, outfitters that wouldn't be access points um, otherwise. And uh, my parallel journey is that, you know, I, I guide in the, during the season and I work at Colorado State University in training and development um, over in the Lori Student Center. I work a lot with student leadership. I've taught in leadership programs for 13 years and being thrown onto some really tough crews. I was like, man, we could do some <laughs> different things around training. And, uh, you know, I also appreciate that Natalie brought up the, the DEI has its, its time in the spotlight. And I think that that is such an important um, reality that, you know, as someone who's been really committed to this work for over 15 years, I came out about 20 years ago and um, my partner, I'm in a multiracial relationship. And so there's just a lot of really close to home uh, parts of this story that's important. And so how do we how do we take this time in the spotlight and make it sustainable uh, so that we utilize this and get people excited and, and accessible? And one of my favorite things is to make 
um, you know, to take the boo out of taboo and to really talk about those, those important topics that do. So that's really the goal of engaged coaching and consulting. Um, we really try to work, we're building. And then I think from an intersectional interwoven framework to recognize that, um, you know, when we look at just specific identities, you know, um, people of color, BIPOC community members, um, ability, gender, uh, it, it misses some of that confluence of identities and really understanding the multiple barriers that can ex exist in a, in, in a, and really pay attention to. So um, recently, uh, about a year and a half ago, the A-Dash um, collaborative was uh, created out of a needed conversation around sexism and sexual harassment. And so again, we seek to to approach that from an interwoven framework. Um, and even thinking about Ethan's statistics, you know, we talked about men and women, but we didn't talk at all about non-binary or transgender folks. And oftentimes when we don't say those things or those identities, they can be unintentionally erased. And I think that that has been what's happened from our, our history. And so how do we recognize that right now and, and talk and, and, and uplift those stories and, and move forward in that? So again, just really, really honored and, and excited to be here and, and learn from my fellow uh, colleagues, happy to answer questions along the way. Quick follow-up question, Emily, will you be down in the Grand Canyon this coming summer? I will. I've got two trips in July. Excellent. Wonderful. And then uh, why don't we have Antoinette, if you could uh, give a little intro, that'd be wonderful. Hi, everyone. My name is Antoinette Lee Toscano. I'm an 11-year Army veteran and um, what else do I do? <laughs> I do? I went blank. I'm the producer of Whitewater TV, a co-founder at Diversified Whitewater, a paddling magazine contributing writer and contributing writer at Culture's Global Multicultural Magazine on TV. I am a, a Kokutat National Brand Ambassador and a paddling team member for Badfish SUP and Team River Runner Fort Collins. Um, I focus, my focus in the outdoor industry is providing equitable representation through Whitewater TV, where we focus on the people, places, and products that we use in paddle sports, but also other adventure sports. And what I noticed when in my work with Diversify Whitewater is that we are making strides to make paddle sports and adventure sports more accessible here in the United States. What about the rest of the world? And so that was a, one of the things that I wanted to do um, was to let little girls and boys in Nepal and Uganda know that this is accessible. This is a thing that exists and the bright colored boats that you see on the river are not just for white people because from the Nanahila River in North Carolina to the Nile River in Uganda, a lot of um, people of color are hearing from other people of color. That's for the white tourists, it's not for us. So I wanted to uh, address that. And through my writing at Culturist Magazine and um, Paddling Magazine, I like to talk about justice, equity, diversity, inclusion in paddle sports, both from the social side, the human side, and also from the um, economic side without quantifying human beings to see like, you know, how much of the 47 percent, how much of the, um, how many of the 47% of um, people of color who are multicultural can I, can I get to come and uh, spend their money here? But that's really not enough. We also are looking for you to hire people of color so that when I, as a BIPOC tourist, go to your um, dude ranch, your hunting club, your kayaking facility, I see more than just staff who look like me who are picking up the trash and doing housekeeping. I also see them guiding and teaching, right? Um, and as my, in my membership in, uh, on paddling teams, one of the things that I like to do is to talk about how a person with a brain injury can have hidden differing abilities like myself and 
um, learning how to kayak, learning how to climb, how to do a technical climb after having a rappelling accident was a big deal. And um, when someone is teaching me, I tell them that I might look like I understand the words that are coming out of your mouth, but my brain can't tell my body what to do and I need a little extra help. And not everyone with a hidden disability or a visual differing ability can feel comfortable saying, I'm a little bit different and I need you to help me in a different way. So um, I, I like to focus on that. And I also like to say, not everybody is a professional kayaker. Some of us are still learning. Um, you know, I don't have a consistent role. <laughs> and I like to talk about the fact that you don't wake up one day and suddenly you're rodeoing a hole. <laughs> you have to swim a lot. <laughs> Although I haven't swam all that much in my career, my paddling career, and I owe that to an 11 year old who taught me an amazing brace. <laughs> he said, Antoinette, since you don't have a role, <laughs> let me teach you how to brace. And so his father is actually, he and his father are my paddling buddies. And his father goes, whoa, Antoinette, I didn't think you were gonna follow my line. I, I thought you were gonna bail. And, and he goes, that was an amazing brace. And I'm like, your son taught me that. <laughs> so the importance of having young people out on the river who can teach adults and other young people things um, be, because that um, boy, he's now 13, not 11. And he's a diversified whitewater um, uh, instructor and safety boater for us, right? So he's helping other young children who look like me to do what he does. And he's amazing. So, and uh, through Diversify Whitewater, we were founded in 2020. And since then, we've uh, provided two free Paddling Skills Day events, river trips and paddling instruction to black indigenous people of color and allies because there are some um, white people who can't afford instruction and, and come from really challenging circumstances too. And we don't want to be the thing that we're trying to change. So um, we introduced 115 black indigenous people of color to paddle sports over two free events. And in 2021, we began last weekend, our 10 event series this year, regional events. And we're super excited to um, share the love of paddle sports with more people. Thank you. Wow. That's incredible, Antoinette. 10 events. I know what you're doing all summer. <laughs> uh, David. You're up. Well, hello, I just wanted to, you know, thank everyone for allowing me to be a part of, of this event. And I'm very grateful to, to have the opportunity to be here. Um, I share an Emily sentiment that uh, I am feeling vulnerable in this moment, just, you know, it's a big, big deal. I want to just be honest with my process. Um, so I come from, I'm a Midwest boy. So I come from the southern part of Illinois, like down by Kentucky. Um, grew up in very rural kind of southern community. Um, <clears throat> right out of high school, was in the military, deployed to Iraq. Um, you know, when you're in a situation like that, it makes you kind of rethink your values and what you're shooting for. So once I got back from that, I moved straight out to Colorado, actually went to Western State College. That's where I got a, a degree in outdoor recreation. Um, at that point, I was kind of a nomad. I lived out in my Subaru. Uh, for a long time, just chasing rivers and um, had the opportunity to guide on about 20 different rivers commercially. So it's been a long time, a lot of time in river canyons and getting to know a lot of different people. And for me, that was uh, an eye-opening experience coming from a very conservative, like kind of rural town, grew up with these really distinct kind of oppressive beliefs, you know, and just to be honest with my process coming, you know, is kind of a painful process to come out of that, that community and be exposed to all these different ideologies and a lot of guilt involved with like how you raise and kind of some of the perspectives that you have. So it was a, a learning opportunity for me in that it was much more than just guiding and, and having a, a new opportunity in life and, and having these new experience. It was a lot of learning for me and a lot of, you know, it, it, I wasn't in my very conservative kind of homogenous community. So for me, um, 
it was a bit of an experience for sure. <laughs> um, and throughout that guiding, you know, experience, I, I got connected with Knowles and Outward Bound and was able to become an instructor. And at that time, got really involved with their, um, at that time, it was their DI curriculum and um, just became really passionate about, you know, I was trying to, I felt at that time kind of making up for, for my experience as a young adult and like, how can I be this agent of change and kind of fight back against, you know, some of the ideologies that I grew up with. Um, and so for me, that kind of headed me in a direction to where, uh, for my graduate degree, I went to Arizona Prescott College, and that's where I really focused on, I got a degree in education with a focus on social justice. And in that, I was really um, kind of exploring the idea of how, how can I, as a white male, you know, ending up in a lot of these um, really homogenous, like white communities, how can I make a difference? How can I inspire people to become like an agent of change and fight back against this? acculturation you know that a lot of people grow up in you know you don't there's a I can't remember who said it but there's a, a statement like you don't choose to be white but you you are held accountable to, to the decisions you make so um, for me you know that wasn't around like the, the 2013 time frame I didn't really um, arrive in Fort Collins area until about uh, 2013 2014 I was guiding on the Cash Laputa River and um, throughout my exploration at, at um, social justice concepts in Prescott, I really was trying to find a way, like, how do I, you know, how do I make up for lost time and not advocating for change? You know, I mean, at a young age, service was so important to me. I, I joined the military, like literally a month after 9-11 happened and, you know, just want to make a difference. So I was always trying to find, like, what was my avenue to, to join all these passions and just be, be that agent of change that I, I so much wanted to be. And so guiding on the Poudre River, we, you know, really just fell into this amazing opportunity. I'm a co-owner and uh, I'm the operations manager of Rocky Mountain Adventures here in town. And, uh, and so through that process, I've just made just really amazing connections with, you know, having the opportunity to be with um, amazing organizations like Diversify Whitewater from, from the very beginning, you know, um, being able to support their, their initiative on the, the Poudre event, and then also being able to just do everything I can to, to make a difference and be available to create opportunity um, for people to, to get into these outdoor spaces um, on, on the Boyd Lake event. And, um, currently serving as a board member for Diversify Whitewater. So currently, um, you know, I'm a father of three and uh, an owner and a, a river outfitter. And so um, I don't know if you can tell my, my hair is definitely turning grayer by the second um, with the three kiddos. <laughs> so they're like eight months to five years old. So definitely busy right now. Um, but I'm passionate and, and, um, uh, you know, I try to be, you know, it, this is a, a big thing for me. Like, I think I work really well in having just really honest, vulnerable, like genuine conversations in small groups. And so for me, this is, you know, a bit intimidating for sure. But, uh, and that's kind of me, you know, just a background of where I come from and I'm just really grateful to be a part. So, Thanks, David. Uh, just imagine it's just the five of us and no one else is here. So yeah, Zoom, this is helping for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we really appreciate uh, having all of you on this call and your various perspectives um, that you bring to these issues. And so um, I do want to take a bit of a deeper dive, uh, Emily, into your engaged coaching and consulting. You shared a little bit, and I just want to ask a little bit more about what Engage Coaching and Consulting does, and maybe a little bit of the genesis of that? Yeah, um, thanks for that, Ethan. I think, you know, the genesis is, I think you will find a lot of folks who are drawn to education. So I got my master's at CSU, um, and uh, education pays decently. I don't want to say that it doesn't. And you will find lots of folks in education with side hustles, right? I mentioned kind of guiding was, was part of it. Um, I think also just the access to the education that I got around diversity, equity, and inclusion in leadership, in organizational change management, in communication. Um, that it just prepared me differently. I have many hours of facilitation and training skills kind of under my belt because of the opportunities that I've had. And so um, being able again to, to run, run parallel um, with this outdoor world, um, specifically within the river industry, um, there was a need that came up. And so uh, I have to really give a shout out to Azra, Arizona Raft Adventure, um, who really encouraged um, engaged to start existing um, in, 
it was this vision that came to fruition. And now we're four facilitators strong and uh, work from a, with a variety of for-profits, nonprofits, libraries, public health. Um, and, and we really, our genesis was within the outdoor industry. And so um, I have a lot of, of honor there, but it can be anything from facilitating difficult conversations around how to embody industries or like organizations commitment uh, to Black Lives Matter. Um, a co-facilitator and I had that conversation recently with an organization to, you know, multi-day retreats and training opportunities around topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and um, really being also intentional that uh, because my identities are what they are, um, co-facilitation really matters. And um, having multiple perspectives and spaces. So I always prefer to co-facilitate, um, to be in dialogue and conversation with, with folks. And, and I believe really strong training is not just about the event or the happening or the Zoom room. It's about the conversations that happen before it and after it and as a, res as a result. And, you know, we're not talking about one-time checkbox training. We're talking about um, how to affect and employ culture change and culture shift. And so that's everything from understanding who's missing from the conversation, assessing your uh, staff and guides about what their experiences have been, building a philosophy of trust and assessing policies and practices and procedures. Um, you know, one of my colleagues who's been pretty active in the, in the chat, uh, Jim Miller with Respect Outdoor Outside, um, has been really involved in the conversation of for, you know, decades now of what does culture change look like? And um, I think the multiple folks who can be committed to that and really know that that's going to take a collaboration of folks that um, that, that, that feels pretty powerful. And um, I think that's a little bit of, of what we do. Um, Is it correct and, to and say that you work yeah. with a variety of outfitters, rafting outfitters? Yes, um, have the opportunity to present um, and host like panels multiple times at America Outdoors, which is a conference that happens every December. Um, hoping to to see some fellow folks uh, here at maybe the next one, and um, yeah, because of that, it's been able to really you you found out you found you find out how small the outdoor world really is, right? Um, you start to see even to the students in this call, you know, my hope is that this panel is just the impetus for folks to reach out to Antoinette or to David or to myself to, to continue having those conversations of I want to do this and I want to do this in in different ways than, ha than has been because it, it has, you know, um, felt it's exclusionary to, to folks who you know, have imposter syndrome, don't feel like, like enough. I didn't feel enough in my own family for a long time. And I, and I still battle that. And so, but I think, you know, transparently talking about that, you know, Antoinette and I were having kind of a conversation before this whole panel started uh, about how important it is to be real. And as David said, uh, vulnerable about the imperfections of, of working in it. And that's how I think we're going to extend it. So, yeah. And is it also correct to say that maybe um, a part of the the genesis for your work with Engage uh, Coaching and Consulting uh, came about because of there was quite a bit of media attention given to um, uh, sexual discrimination in the Grand Canyon amongst outfitters and the National Park Service. That was kind of a, I don't, it, it seems like yesterday, but it was probably been five, six, seven years ago um, that that kind of came to light. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, as Natalie mentioned, this is this is kind of a moment. I think our racial reckoning that we've been experiencing again, which is a resurgent from the previous Black Lives Matter movement, I think the Me Too movement um, gave light to uh, sexism and sexual harassment in a variety. And yes, I think, um, you know, outside magazines, specifically the online uh, should be given a lot of kudos to really bringing light to difficult conversations that people really didn't want to hear about. And when I say people, I mean specifically folks within privileged or um, identities that have always seen themselves within it. And it's like, stop talking about this, talk about the outdoors. And it's like, we are talking about the outdoors. It should be able to be enjoyed by everyone without humans getting in the way and our bad behavior. And so I think that that really was able to start that conversation in a more significant way when it previously had been, right? I've done a lot of work with Grand Canyon River Guides, um, with the Whale Foundation that looks at guide mental health. And um, so much of it is around being pushed out, 
gaslit, which means, right, being told you're crazy and you're not experiencing something when you very much are experiencing something um, and trying to kind of keep the status quo and um, whether it be a boys club or whether it be a hazing mentality of we went through it, so you have to go through it too. And, and how do we create codes of conduct for our passengers who also take advantage of environments and um, this, the class identity within seasonal work that can come up. Um, equal pay for uh, the important work that guides do is often overlooked and, and the seasonal lifestyle is not um, necessarily one that is, it is done for passion, um, less than pay, I think a lot of times. And if I'm speaking out of turn, I would love someone to give me feedback in the chat. Um, I think one of the most important aspects of DEI J work specifically is um, an open relationship with feedback through management, outfitters, guides, guests, um, folks who have uh, not had um, as much access of a voice uh, and, and, and how can we use that to, to move forward and be better. So. I can't wait to hear um, from my fellow panelists about um, what some of their experiences has been and origin stories. So thanks. Thanks, again. Emily. Thank you, Emily. Um, Antoinette, you know, sort of building on that, you know, Emily brought up a, a number of different, you know, hot topics and issues, you know, related to uh, paddling and diversity, equity, inclusion and justice. And I was hoping you could share a little bit more about how you became involved with Diversify White Water, because I'm sure it exists to address many of the things that she's just raised. So. Some of them, yeah, a, a lot of them. <laughs> not <clears throat> not so much the sort of the industry component. Uh, so what I am doing, and I'll talk about this, is addressing it from a whitewater TV perspective. Um, but in diversify what so with the origin story of diversify whitewater, the short version is that I was at a volunteering at a kayaking pool session. I couldn't participate because I needed to have my shoulder and bicep reconnected. <laughs> so I was there in a voluntary capacity. And uh, this was two weeks before the lockdown in Colorado, the pandemic lockdown in Colorado. And in walks this Asian American woman carrying a kayak. And she set her boat down and we looked at each other and... <laughs> We had the most awkward stranger hug. I don't even think we said a word to each other. We might have said hi. And then we hugged because we were just so excited to see another woman of color that also paddled. And so we met, but they didn't really have an opportunity to connect. But I thought, well, maybe she'll be back and, you know, we'll be on the same paddling team through, diverse, uh, through Team River Runner because uh, she was considering volunteering there. And so then we went into pandemic lockdown, of course, and a few months later, the um, um, Black Lives Matter movement um, really started to, I think for myself, resonate with me in terms of what more can I do as a person of color to, ensure that nature is um, the, the human right of access to nature is accessible to everyone. And so I did what I do a lot of or most is I started writing. I pitched an article, a series of articles to a uh, global multicultural magazine and it's a five part series on the lack of diversity in paddle sports from a global perspective, because it's an international magazine. And then Lily contacted me <laughs> and she had this great idea of, um, I think we probably read the immersion research community letter in response to BLM uh, community uh, letter that they released probably about the same time. And so I was pitching this article and meanwhile she was brainstorming what she could do um, to promote diversity in paddle sports for people of color. And she said, hey, I've got this idea about creating a BIPOC paddling club in uh, color or group in Colorado and um, providing free instruction and river trips and are you interested? And I'm like, heck yeah, <laughs> because I started helping people um, to find uh, their way 
to reconnecting or connecting to nature through paddle sports in 2014, because in 2013, paddle sports helped me ditch my walker and my service dog. I was really ill in 2013, trying to recover from all of the issues related to a broken back and a brain injury. And paddle sports got me out of, away from my walker and back into life. And so I started sharing that with other veterans and other people with disabilities and talking and writing about it. And so when Lily said, hey, let's start this group. Um, and it's now, a, not even a year later, and now it's a regional organization. I was like, yes, let's do it. I thought it was brilliant that two BIPOC women would be doing this work in paddle sports because we are the least likely people that you would run into on the river. Before Diversify Whitewater, I had only experienced um, paddling, paddle sports with five other people of color. And I count. The reason I count is because when I'm in a beautiful location and I'm just enjoying all of my river buddies and the experience, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the, the freedom of being in nature in the back country, I mean, like back, back country. <laughs> I won the main salmon lottery last year and I went on that trip too. <laughs> and I, and I took my white friends. <laughs> so take that. <laughs> so anywho, <laughs> um, where was I going with that? I don't know. But <laughs> when I'm in the back country, and I'm just kind of like, you know, when if you've never been on the main salmon and you're on this private beach and it's just you and your friends and you've been kayaking or rafting all day and you're just having a great meal and the stars are brilliant and there's no sounds except for nature and your talkative friends. Just kidding. <laughs> I wish that other people of color, even in my own family who call me a white girl, let that sink in for a minute, for a minute because I'm outdoorsy, right? So um, I wished people, other people of color would join me. And um, yeah, that kind of saddens me that, so systemic oppression, created this environment and Dr. Um, I don't think she's a doctor, but Beth uh, Collier, who's a psychotherapist, a nature therapist out of the UK says, when um, people of color came to cities like London, for example, and they saw no blacks, no dogs, no Irish, I guess I wouldn't be welcome because I'm black Irish and I have a dog, but um, they, they saw these signs in the city that says, we don't really want you here. So, and in the US they saw whites only, right? And so even in my own family, I talk about this in a DEI panel that I hosted on Whitewater TV. My parents, when I told them before I started kayaking that, well, let me back up. I'm born and raised in New York City and I've never considered myself a New Yorker. I camped in my New York City backyard. <laughs> <laughs> with my dog because I just always wanted to be outdoors. And my sisters would say, you know, you're black, right? We don't do this. <laughs> so that, that was my life. So I went to Virginia to hunt and fish and ride horses and farm with my cousins because it really felt inaccessible, even in a, um, a, a black home, right? I, I wasn't free to be myself without judgment. So anyway, I hope I answered your your question in a roundabout way. <laughs> definitely, no, definitely. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Thank you. Hey, David, uh, I'm really curious um, how you kind of, you started making these connections and you chose to pursue social justice in your graduate uh, degree and, and work, and then how it's then impacted your career in the paddle sports industry. And I, and the deeper dive part of that, and I can repeat this later if this is too much, but um, I'm curious how that you're then operationalizing uh, DEI at Rocky Mountain Adventures. Yeah, I can kind of talk through those quickly here. Um, you know, being raised in a conservative community, uh, 
you know, I grew up with a family uh, of color and they, they were like my family, you know, my extended family. And uh, it was kind of, it was kind of tough. I, I grew up and I had all of these um, kind of, you know, you're acculturated in these oppressive ideologies and, and they just didn't really fit. So for me, it was like, well, they're different, you know, like they don't really fit into to some of the understanding of the larger community. And as I got out of that community, I, it's just, I, I had an understanding of what that family experience kind of in my, in my community, the limitations placed on just uh, the overarching ideologies of a, a conservative kind of rural town in, in the Midwest. And um, for me, I, I just, I had that, I, I felt like I owed it to them. I mean, these are, this is my family. I grew up with them. I love them like, like they're my own. And um, it was just kind of a, a jump start into trying to make a difference and, and being the person that I want to be and making a change for those that don't have a voice and have been, um, you know, as Antoinette said, like systematically oppressed over, over generations, you know, um, and how this has impacted me kind of in paddle sports is I think it's really enriched my experience and, and made it so much more genuine and long lasting for me. You know, it, it's one thing to, to take a raft and take a community of folks down and just go rafting, but to, to have these really intimate conversations and, and you know, for me, like when you have these opportunities, like when I'm working for an organization like Knowles, it really puts us in the forefront and like allows you an opportunity to, to have these conversations that are really, um, that can be really uh, hard for people just to open up and, and just to be vulnerable about their experience. You know, I think um, that was what made me really passionate. And I, I, I thought that, you know, from my background and, and just taking ownership of where I came from and talking about my journey and where I'm headed and, and just having a conversation and, and talking about um, the intention that needs to be brought and the patience and, um, and, and just the, the pain of kind of unlearning racism, you know, it, um, I think just being able to work in small groups and it's just really enriched um, my life and my community and opened so many doors to just, um, becoming an advocate for change and, and um, raising really, you know, raising my family in a way that, that we continue to, to grow and, and, and make connections that will advocate for people that, that don't have a voice or haven't been given a voice or continually disenfranchised by systems in place. And, um, you know, how I'm bringing that into to my experience as a co-owner and, and an operational manager here at Rocky Mountain Adventures, I didn't see so much opportunity to connect with, with um, organizations like Diversify Whitewater. And, and I hope to in the future, um, you know, we're, we're in the third year of ownership here. So it's been kind of a shotgun start with COVID and everything. So we're, you know, down the road, really excited to, um, you know, I do all the hiring. I can bring um, so much intention into um, what will benefit our community. I mean, we want to be a, a connection to our community and um, engage our community in a way that, that promotes the growth, um, you know, and the support of BIPOC communities. And I can bring in um, people and I can be intentional with hiring. I can create scholarship opportunities for folks in the BIPOC community and the larger communities that, that don't have those opportunities and just forge connections to, um, as Antoinette said, like have representation and um, and leadership roles within our organization. So um, for me, you know, on top of just opportunities that we can create, it, it's just really being intentional with the community that we, that we form and maintain as an organization. So well, I and I know that, that and in, in the case I miss this, but I'm, I just want to highlight that I know RMA has been uh, very active in their support of Diversify Whitewater um, and in providing, uh, I think, support at events, whether that was gear or, or other types of support. Um, and so I just want to, to highlight that that has been one uh, way that I think RMA has really kind of supported these efforts. And uh, feel free to add on to that if. if yeah, um, absolutely. I, I was so excited to, to, to be a part of Diversify Whitewater and Poudre Canyon and be there in whatever capacity I was needed and, and forge connections that I think you know, create the foundation just to build the, this community into something that um, that we all look forward to, to it becoming, you know, and then at Boyd Lake, I mean, <laughs> there's no telling what I look like driving down the, 
the the highway or the interstate just dragging all of this river equipment down and then throwing it out and blowing up all these rafts and um so just we're excited as an organization to just assist in any way possible just to create opportunities for communities that have had over time just limited to no access to, to these opportunities so for me i want to um just be able to continue to just grow and forge these um these relationships with with folks like Antoinette and diversify white water and, and the local community so thanks david yeah Thanks for sharing because, you know, a lot of our students, you know, uh, are interested themselves in running their own organizations or they're wanting to go into operations and make a difference. And the question's always how, you know, we, we, we fundamentally believe that more needs to be done in this space, but how do we do it? So that is really helpful. Um, but building on from that then, and I'm going to open up this question to everyone, you know, what are some important lessons that you've learned in the work that you've been doing in this space um, that you can share with our students and the rest of the audience here about how they can make a difference and how they can help create a more diverse and equitable industry. Anyone's willing, anyone can go first, yeah. <laughs> I'll take that question. One of the things that I am learning, um, so I'm a former IT CEO, so in addition to be a freelance writer, and um, I still consult in a number of industries, but one of the industries that I consult in is also the outdoor industry with America Outdoors and in with private com uh, uh, companies. And the thing that I always knew, but it really hits home, is that it is a delicate art to implement DEI at any organization. Um, as involved as Rocky Mountain Adventures and David Terry is and um, the rest of his organization, they very seldom talk about it, <laughs> right? And it's because, and I don't want to put words in their mouth, the feeling that I get is, is that an organization like Rocky Mountain Adventures or Kokutat, for example, or Werner Paddles and Astral Footwear and Liquid Logic and Immersion Research and so many more in this industry, they've been doing so much work quietly. And yes, more needs to be done. But together, this grassroots effort of industry leaders, community organizers like myself and Lily Durkee, who is a CSU PhD student, if I forgot to mention that. <laughs> and um, we are all working together with a cadre of volunteers. We have volunteers that volunteer with us, who have been with us for several months. There are some that participate during uh, events, but it's, a challenge and it's a delicate thing to talk about what you're doing to promote diversity, equity, inclusion in any industry, because as Black Enterprise Magazine said, you don't want to turn Black Lives Matter into Black Lives Marketing. At the same time, here's the rub. If you don't find a way to talk about it, then the assumption is within the communities that you're not doing enough. And so an organization who's one of our great supporters uh, uh, Liquid Logic Kayaks was called out on the Hammer Factor podcast and uh, uh, saying that they didn't do, they made, you know, BLM statements and haven't done enough. Like, first of all, what is enough? And second, they've been a supporter and we didn't contact them. They contacted me and said, hey, I want to get involved. How do I do this? I, I don't know, really know where to start. They were very vulnerable about it, but they've been there with us, opening doors, providing gear and apparel and discounts off of coupons, so uh, discounts off of kayaks so that people who come to our events and say, I love this sport. This is amazing. They can now affordably go buy a kayak, right? And it's interesting to hear someone uh, or an organization like Liquid Logics or like RMA um, to be so involved and so committed with time and resources. But then we hardly ever hear 
what they're doing. And it's because if it's kind of a catch 22, if you see something and then it looks like you're, you know, using black lives marketing and black lives, uh, um, uh, capitalism, right. But if you don't say anything, then you may, you could fall victim to cancel culture. So, um, what I have been doing with other consultants together is helping organizations to stay core to their, I don't know, hunting um, lodge or their um, guide, um, their, their raft guide as, as raft guide outfitters, but also incorporate new hiring and recruiting strategies so that they're not recruiting in the same markets where they don't um, connect with people of color who are looking for jobs in the industry, for example, and to use marketing effectively where it doesn't come across as you're trying to make a dollar on, um, um, in a way that is inauthentic. So it's a, it's a delicate balance. Um, and so that's the thing that I would like to impress on your students is that finding creative ways to authentically promote diversity at the same time being mindful that if you mishandle that, then it's almost as bad as not doing anything so that's what I'd like to leave you with. You know, I really appreciate that, Antoinette. I think that that, um, you know, that, that concept of it's, it's yeah. delicate, right. And, and, and how, and how is it done and, and what is it? And there's no, there's no one way, right. There's no roadmap. I love that you asked that question of like, what is enough? Right. And I think like, it's, it's so much about aligning with integrity and with purpose and, and reason, right. And, and truly being about community um, and, and expanding beyond your own story, your own narrative and being able to <laughs> exercise the skills of listening. Um, and I think so often we, we want to talk, right. I want to talk on this panel, but I think the really important thing is how do we how do we listen just deeply to the realities um, and, and to the, the stories of others? Uh, I have a, a strong belief that one of the one of the ways we need to move this work forward is to be intergenerational and to question the expectations that generations across. Because you look at if you look at the Grand Canyon guiding community, and you've got solidly six generations within that industry and folks coming, um, you know, right at 18, 19, having much different expectations around usage of pronouns, inclusion of diversity, equity, inclusion topics within guide training. And then you have folks who are like, this has not ever been a thing. And so how do you with integrity be in those conversations and, and put that onus and labor on appropriate people who are willing, paid, compensated, to do those that that work, um, and not just on like um, you know my outfitter that I work with primarily has a, a few guides of color, and when all the white guides are asking, you know, well, tell me about your experience. Like it can't be as bad as you. That's undue, unnecessary labor, and and it's it's up to coming to panels panels like this, right? It's up to um, being comfortable talking about race. Uh, with white folks, comfortable talking about gender with cisgender people, comfortable talking about class with folks from within your own class. And I think an ability status, you know, I, I really appreciate Antoinette, you know, you sharing your, your intimacies around, um, around your own story. And I think that's really how we learn is we build authentic, hopefully reciprocal relationships across similarities and difference and exercise that, that skill. So that's kind of how I would answer that question and just gratitude for what's been shared already. Thanks, Emily. I'm going to interject to formally end our panel with the caveat that if any panelist wants to hang around for a few more minutes, um, we'd certainly welcome uh, any more uh, feedback from you all and any questions from our audience members if you want to throw them in the chat. But I just want to say to formally conclude this, thank you all so, so very much um, for your time and energy. Uh, I want to honor uh, the commitment of an hour that we asked from you. And so 
really appreciate your presence here. And if you need to leave, there will be no hard feelings. Um, and then if you want to stick around for a few more minutes, I'm sure we can continue this chat because while an hour is nowhere near enough for this conversation, an hour on another Zoom call is certainly probably beyond where we're at for their, the day today. So I appreciate it so very much. I have a few more minutes because I'm about to go get at some giant walleye. Hopefully this this night I'm catching a big walleye <laughs> <laughs> or I'm going to cry myself to sleep, but we'll see what happens. Thanks, Antoinette. Appreciate it you know, so much. Um, my Ricky. name is Bill Dvorak and I own Dvorak <laughs> Expeditions and we've been outfitting on these Western rivers for over 40 years. And I've always tried to diversify my crew. I've had a number of uh, South Americans and Costa Ricans and this year, I actually have a young black girl who's coming to train with me. And I am just interested of where I might go to actually find more people of color to come and train to be guides for my operation. Anyone from the panel care to jump in on that? I've so, got a few ideas, but. So some of the ways that you can recruit within the BIPOC community is through organizations like Outdoor Afro, Melanin Base Camp, Unpopular Black, um, uh, Vibe Tribe Adventures, and Diversify Whitewater to say, hey, we're hiring. Would you make this announcement for us? So, yeah. Love Let's the name. Really the quick with all those names. Is there any way you could put those in chat? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And I'll just I'll just jump in as well. You know. I think the university environments are another great opportunity for you. Um, you know, speaking for CSU here, we are a large land grant university with a pretty fair, diverse, uh, you know, collection of students and those that are even studying natural resources. And we have, uh, in addition to a natural resource tourism degree program, we have an outdoor program. And so we're engaging students in a variety of ways. And so we have a career center that shares opportunities um, so that might be one option. And then thinking about other universities that are, have similar options might be another uh, outlet for you. Ricky, did you want to jump in? I just wanted to also quickly add to that, um, that, you know, more and more universities are starting to add, you know, individual degrees or courses or minors that specifically look at diversity, whether it's in the outdoors, whether it's in conservation and other spaces. And so, looking for those kinds of programs as well, you may find individuals who come from more diverse backgrounds, but are also interested in the outdoors or conservation and, and, and paddling as well, so. Okay, Great. can I jump in here? All right, uh, first and foremost, I think this was a wonderful panel um, and information that was being shared. And just, uh, I heard a couple of questions and I just, you know, the director and me had to, to respond to some things. And I think, you know, one thing that we, ha we have to be mindful of is that, um, you know, one statement I always share with our faculty and staff within our college is never let tradition be a prisoner of innovation. Never let tradition be a prisoner of innovation. And so sometimes what we do is um, we, we, we have these experiences that we are looking for when we hire people and, and not look at innovative practices on how we can explore different expertise and different lived experiences to enhance our current work environment, number one. Number two, um, you know, uh, we're in this position now where there's a lot of organizations that want to diversify and expand their efforts. But I will caution organizations when you say this, because when you say that, that's like saying, well, I'm building a bridge and I'm waiting for people to come over, but you need to cross the bridge to the communities that you're trying to connect with to let them know that there's opportunities there. If you're just saying we have an open sign and that's it, that's not enough marketing. And so, you know, um, the, I wanna give kudos to Natalie and, and, and Ethan because, you know, one thing that I've been really big on is intentionality. I'm not about counting numbers. I'm about making numbers count. And so what are you doing behind the scenes to first make yourself friendly to the communities that you're trying to reach out to and then invite them in to make these things. You know, there's a lot of work that Natalie and Ethan did to go out to these communities, go out to these organizations, meet with these individuals, form genuine relationships that they know that we care about what they're trying to do and give that platform, and then use our resources and platform to let them edify their skill sets. 
Number three, I think a big thing is that for some, it, it, to the life of me, it still baffles me. We do not utilize the leverage of partnering with tribal colleges and HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. There are 17 different natural resource programs across the uh, historical black college and universities. There's 22 natural resource programs across tribal colleges. If we just reach out to those universities and do a little Google search and just type in natural resource program in tribal colleges or natural resource programs in HBCUs, you'll get a list of organizations that are minority serving that will, then you can go and advertise what you're trying to do, what you're trying to enhance. And they will let you know whether or not they can, because one thing about um, the, the demographics of minorities going into these spaces is that we can sense BS. So you gotta be genuine. You can sense BS, you know when People say, oh, we just want to invite you to the table. And it's like, yeah, you want me to invite to the table, but you don't want me to dance. You know, it's like, let me put my song track on. You know, let me choose the song I want to dance to as well. Those kind of things. And so, you know, make sure that when we're, when we're trying to expand these out, how are you doing it in an authentic way? Because again, we're not about trying to make the numbers count here at, at Warner College. We're trying to count. I mean, we're not trying to make the, uh, we're not trying to count numbers. We're trying to make the numbers count. And so what we're trying to do is it, it does no good to retain or re recruit and get more money and you have holes in your pocket. So you gotta figure out internally, what can we do to justify and, and make sure that the experiences of one or two is, is, is equitable, is fun, it's a positive experience, and then they will go word of mouth and spread that out. Number four is that we also have to think about when you're trying to do these things, I heard some, some conversations about, you know, some of the uh, economical uh, barriers that might be coming to that place. So how do you make this a, a fun engagement with a family? It doesn't mean no good to send my daughter to go whitewater rafting and she gets all the gear and then the mom and dad has nothing. She's not going until you guys do another event because I can't circulate a family, a, a gathering around it. Whereas when we look at uh, many uh, white colleagues, there's been a family centric uh, development and introduction to these outdoor recreations. And so those are just a few points that I wanted to enhance on how you can really build and expound this notion of really wanting to make DEI um, part of the DNA of your organization that is, is felt true and genuinely across the communities that you serve. And that's what we're doing here today with this program. So again, thank you, Natalie and Ethan for doing that. And I encourage our students to continue to look at ways to be involved in these processes. Thank you. Thanks so much Thank for you. that, Ricky. Um, just, I'm sorry, Ethan. I just, there's a question in the chat and it's a great question. I want to make sure that we don't ignore it. And it's from Matt. Um, he says, you know, thank you, first of all. Uh, the, the statement and then question is, you know, when I drive up the Puta Canyon, the groups of people I see engaged in barbecues, fishing, family reunions, et cetera, present a much larger spectrum of diversity than action sports in general or paddling in particular. How can we move towards DEI goals by effectively engaging with communities who are using the same spaces for different purposes? I think it's a great question. I think Ricky answered it, you know, a little bit um, unintentionally um, in, in some of the stuff he was talking about there. I wasn't sure if David or Antoinette wanted to take a stab at it. Um, I also have some ideas in the background, but happy to listen to you guys and, and see, see what ideas you've got. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I think, you know, there is a lot of representation up in Puerto Canyon. I think, you know, I would be lying if I sat here and said I have all the answers. And I think, you know, what our intention is, is to, to move forward in a way that is sustainable and not like Antoinette said, it's just to put your name out there and really, you know, have nothing behind the words that you're saying, you know. So we want to be intentional moving forward to, to create these relationships that, that can be ongoing and we can, we can build from them. Um, but I mean, I, I think it goes back to, to forming the, the connection that we discussed. I mean, when we operate up there, just uh, continuing to get our name out there and, and, and to really be open and honest to, to a discussion about to hear from the community and, and what the community needs and how we can bring that into our organization and, um, and, and move forward in a genuine and authentic way. Matt, I, I want to also add, you know, my experience is not within the paddle sports industry by any means. Um, I'm much more familiar with the ski industry. And it, and it, this makes me think about an example. It, it's a very similar situation we've seen with, with ski and ski areas, particularly those that are located near urban centers where there is a much more diverse population. And one, one way the ski industry has started to, to move into this space is recognizing 
and welcoming those that come for snow play. So they're not coming to ski or snowboard because that's a step too far, you know, the, the, the jump from, from never seeing snow to all of a sudden getting on a ski or a snowboard is, is challenging. But a lot of these families come just to experience snow, to make snowballs, to build snowman, you know, and, and I can see a similar situation potentially, you know, with what you're describing up at the Puda where, you know, the first thought foremost isn't to, to get the family out on a raft and go rafting on the river. It's, it's just to experience the river first in a very simple way whether it's having a picnic right next to it, you know, dipping your toes into the water, that kind of thing. Um, but the ski industry started to make space for it. Um, now, obviously, the situations are a little bit different where they have leases and, and, and rights to the, to the area so they can charge, you know, nominal fees for people to go in there, but create an intentional space for them to use that. And in doing so, slowly introduce them to, to the culture and what it is that, that they do. And I wonder if that same sort of, thinking can be applied to the paddle sports industry where you know outfitters can can welcome that kind of behavior again space is is always an issue but slowly introduce families um to what it is that they do beyond just watching you know people raft by them and going down the river natalie i'll I'll piggyback because what you're talking about we have an amazing opportunity in the city of fort collins we just completed a fort collins whitewater park And this place was built with intentionality to bring people to the river and not just people really engaging in kayaking and and paddleboarding and rafting. It's a place for people to come and play, families to come and play. And and if you've been down there or seen it, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's not uh, white, just white males making $75,000. It's a full spectrum of folks down there. And the same is true up at Picnic Rock in many ways. Um, and so there's great opportunities, I think, in those settings. Thank you, City of Fort Collins, to start engaging folks in the river. It's not something to fear, right? It's something to appreciate and enjoy. And then let's go beyond that step by step. And before you know it, maybe you're whitewater kayaking. I don't know. Yeah, and we've really been intentional to try to establish a relationship with the city to give us an opportunity to work with local communities down at the play park specifically. And, you know, where we we are a resource to have these conversations and and bring them in and, and allow us to build as an organization and as a community awareness of, of not only the the risks involved around hydrology and the, you know the river itself, but um, to introduce ourselves just a, as a, a local resource and, and start to forge that connection with community members that, that um, it wouldn't be done without intention. Like I, 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 I truly uh, appreciate the, the concept that was brought up about you can't just build a bridge and say, come on over. Like you got you to gotta cross that bridge and bring people over. So, I mean, I think that's what we look forward to is like getting, just getting our hands there and get out in the mix and, and meeting and greeting and getting our, our name out there to, to say we're, we're excited to start the conversation and we're here and we, we want to be a part um, uh, you know, of a more positive future. So I think at this point, uh, we're going to formally, formally end our meeting. I uh, really appreciate everyone's attendance today. I know some of you were voluntold, uh, but many of you also joined us on your own. And I just so appreciate the opportunity to, to have you here and to engage in this conversation, and especially to our panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, David. Have a wonderful evening. See you on the water.